Well, let's get into it then. Who saw that performance coming? Me. Um, I think a few people, I don't think people saw it. I think people hoped for it and knew it was in there somewhere. Mm. You can't look at what we've done at the World Cup and go, that's how England were going to perform in that semi-final off, off form. But you could say it around some of the players. And we said it, didn't we, last week? Like Those boys are going to have to go back to the semi-final against New Zealand four years ago and find something. They've all got it individually. And my God, didn't it come out? And yet the weather was a bit of a leveller, let's be honest. Um, but England were a completely different team to anything that we've seen at the World Cup. You know, the desire, the fight, the physicality, you know, the the way they just chuck themselves around. And, you know, we're going to obviously talk about a few refereeing decisions, but the boys were putting everything out there. And the way they were flying to rocks and tackles without a care in the world for their own self-preservation. Look at the way Curry walks off the field when he comes off eventually. That's a snapshot. That's battered. I said to my like he, next they, to they emptied yeah. the tanks. They've gone to the well, emptied the tanks, and it was it was a heroic performance from majority of them. Um, you know, we chatted about Joe Marler last week. He gets to start. Coley, he starts. You know, Jim's have used Coley for years. You know, one of the big things was when those two go off, the game changes. Like yeah. Joe Marler was outstanding. He had the red lycra shorts on, in a little nod of appreciation to our Twitter exchange, should we call it? last week and I, I just knew he was going to put the red light he was only missing the gloves but he had the red light because I thought he, he needs an Andy Goode performance I'm joking he was he was brilliant um, and to a man Marrow unbelievable best he's played, best he's played yeah. in I'd say three years yeah and the, so they all stepped up Ben Earl again he's been fantastic throughout the whole World Cup um, isn't it mad to think that he, he hardly started a game before the World Cup for England but had 15 or 17 appearances off the bench um, Curry was everywhere, smashing people, just not a care in the world for his own safety or his body. Uh, Courtney Laws, huge. Like, you can go through them. Retiring and as well. Yeah. And, you know, we can come on to that. What a fabulous career he's had. Four World Cups. Jeez. I mean, he has put in a, a massive shift ring. But you, you look across the field. Did I see that sort of performance coming? I hoped we had something like that in us. And now we're chatting about it you look back on the game and you look at the differences in such a tight game and obviously their bench had a way bigger impact than our bench. You know, I thought, I don't want to be negative, but I thought Billy was very poor. You know, very he, poor? Very poor. When he came on, I got a question about Billy. I feel a bit harsh saying it because we just lost the World Cup semi-final, but he comes on in look the first big. half of Curry. Say again? Look big. Yeah. Well, no, I, I'm just like... The way he struts and, and walks on and like walks around and it's like he's a bit lethargic and everyone else is like battering themselves to get a yard with the ball, get an inch in a tackle, win the collision, get a neutral collision, whatever. He just didn't seem like he was wanting it or at the races really. He obviously spilled a few balls. The try that they end up scoring comes off the back of him at the tail of the line out and it's like everyone had energy and sometimes too much energy with the celebrating and the, how pumped we were, but that was part of England's psyche. And Billy was like in a different team or something at times compared to where the levels that the other boys were at. But to a man, bar a couple, they were phenomenal. Uh, Owen Farrell, our skipper, yes, he overstepped the mark. I think he gave four penalties away. It's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. It is a lot. And obviously the big one when he wouldn't give the ball back and they get another 10 metres and then mm -hmm. Libert kicks it from 49 metres. Does he get it? If he doesn't give the 10 metres away, probably not. But um, that's the faz that he felt. And he, he did boil over a bit, didn't he? Let's be honest. But that's where he got his team to. For that war, it was a war. For that war, he got his team at the levels that they needed to physically, emotionally. And it was never going to be... When the rain was coming down and, you know, Jim was... Obviously, out there saying it's absolutely pushing down, pal. Um, it was going to be a leveller, and it was going to be that sort of game. There's going to be no free flowing rugby, no chucking the ball around willy nilly like we've seen the Springboks do. Um, it was going to become a war of attrition, a ten man game, chase the kicks, win the aerial battle, break down, smash the life out of anyone that you see, both legally and illegally, chop tackles, head first tackles, whatever. It was a brutal game. And one for the purists around set piece and everything that goes with it. 
and we'll debate all the scrums till uh, the cows come home. But it was a thoroughly enthralling game for every other reason and every different reason that we loved those two quarterfinals the week before in Paris. Um, you know, proud to be English, seeing that performance, um, but obviously devastated with how it turned out. Because let's be honest, when you get into the position that we got into, 15-6 up, in the manner that we dominated huge parts of that game, and you could see the panic in the South Africans' bench, the management, they're all shouting at each other, like down the walkie-talkies, and you can see everyone's just listening to whatever Razzy says. He's the gaffer, isn't he? Yeah, the complete he gaffer. But you can see all the panic, and they're all like, ah. you know. And they made some brilliant big calls. Yeah, I feel for Marnie Lebock, taking him off after 30-odd minutes... It was the right decision tactically because of the weather, because of how the game was unfolding. But, geez, I mean, Jim, have you ever been hooked off before half-time? No, but I have done it half-time and it's yeah. embarrassing. Like you it's it's embarrassing. awful at half-time, isn't it? Exactly. Highest level and you're a million percent right. I don't know if you... T- did you tweet it or not? I saw something on social media and I was going to put it myself, but I just thought, no, I don't want to be too harsh. But it was definitely the right decision. And yeah. that's the thing, as in Rassi Erasmus, you're 100% right, is running the show, made a massive decision... Did that win them the game? Well, it didn't really change much, but what it did do is move it into an old school game in which we've seen South Africa before and more comfortable. And yeah. then I'm sure we will go through more parts of the game, but Andre Pollard to get that kick at the end and have the knackers to do that and the confidence to do that. Um, yeah, like as in Mali Labot just looked off, didn't he? Dropped the ball a couple of times, like shanked a couple of kicks, even though he was under pressure. Uh, his kicks to touch were poor as well. And I think you called it a year ago when I said that Andre Pollard, was he the right man for Leicester? That's yet to be proven, but there's no doubt about it. On test level and when it really matters, his confidence and the quality, he's world class. And was he the difference? I'm not too sure. I'll just go back to Andy Rowe's first question about did you see that performance coming? I genuinely did. And with the game plan, which they deployed unbelievably well, that kicking game, kicked the ball 41 times yeah. with the set piece, which was functioning marrow physically, the way that you mentioned about Tom Curry and Ben Earl around the breakdown. Freddie Stewart, that game was made for him going and up. About the big one we haven't spoken about yet as well, George Martin. Oh, I was going to come on to him. Yeah. Tweeted a while ago when he played. Yeah. Was it a Leicester yeah. game that he should be England's starting second row? I, I thought yeah. it should have been him and Ollie Chesham, but Marrow came back to the fore, was unbelievable. Freddie Stewart, all but one kick, the yeah. one that mattered at the end, where Quagga Smith goes up against him, knocks it on, that's the scrum that it comes off. All but one. He was phenomenal as well. Perfect game plan, rattled South Africa. They were nowhere near emotionally at the level they were in the quarterfinals, but that's credit to England. And, yeah, going further into the game, I don't know, the referee's been brought up. I actually feel really sorry for Ben O'Keefe, especially before the game had even started when he was coming up on the big screen. The crowd was going ballistic. And I only looked at the second half of the game. More specifically, I watched the last 20 minutes because I had my views on Ben O'Keefe and I, I I didn't want to be too harsh and I knew we were going to talk about the scrum at the end that's doing the rounds on social media. Honestly, the last 10 minutes where Snyman scores, the scrums, the decisions, he made every single decision right. I, I agree. I agree. Um, and you know what I mean? I actually thought at the start of the game, yeah, and we'll come to it. The start of the game, I thought he gave a lot to England. Yes, agree. Mm-hmm. That, and I even tweeted it, I said, I love him, Ben O'Keefe, because he is, he, we were getting the rub of the green from him. Really were. And there's all these pictures on, as Jim's going to talk about on social media, of, of the scrum. First thing that happens in that scrum is Genji's knees on the floor. Yeah. Which is a penalty. And that he's clear with how he says it, isn't he? Yeah. And I couldn't he hear says that knees in on the, the floor, which led to that, which led to you getting underneath the tight end and you both chasing each other in and the angle. And yes, the the angle, the picture from the the shot above, it looks like, you know, scrummage straight, no one's scrummaging straight. They're both in on an angle. But he was dead right. Hundred percent. Dead right. Hundred percent right. right. That scrum at the end, which was the the big call, obviously. Yeah. There was a few scrums before. Big decisions, big players. Willie LaRue, when he comes on, calls the mark, did he? On the 22, just puts the ball down, they scrum. And that exchange from that point between the big players, 
off that scrum, kicks to Freddie Stewart. Freddie Stewart kicks back. Then the up and under goes up. Yeah. Quite, and it's Quagga Smith, again, who had the turnover at the end of the game for France, is the one that goes up against Freddie Stewart. And that's the scrum then, which mm. every, every, everyone's debating. And I can go into more details about it if you want. Like you listen to Dave Flatman, Bernard Jackman's put a few things up. Like I've gone through it. I love scrummaging. I look at it. A lot of the times, the referees, they are 50-50 decisions. Like one thing to look at when you talk about a dominant scrum is if you really want to have a look at what teams are dominant, you, of course, go and look at the front row. So whatever side the camera's on, for that scrum specifically, yep. it was on the tight head. The decision was made on the loose head with Genji's yep. knees going down, which we've been privy to the different camera angles, so it was 100% right. But you look at Kyle Sinclair's first movement on the engage of the scrum on the set, his foot goes back. So the yep. minute your foot goes back, that means the weight on your foot, as it comes up, the weight of the scrum is coming through, and that happened all the time when that front row came on. So they were never in a dominant position at all. Yeah. Whereas Coley, old school, Marler as well, there was, it was more of a contest. And I'd say that South Africa got, not necessarily in the scrum, but some kind of micro decisions against them. But on the biggest stage, Ben O'Keefe there has made the biggest call. And England fans will hate this and it's undeniable, right. but he was 100% right. And you've yeah. got to give him credit for that. Yeah, you have to. And, you know, looking at the game as a whole, you can fight, pick holes in loads of breakdowns and all stuff. But I actually think that on the balance of the game, you can pick out individual decisions. But it, he was pretty fair across. You know, there's some that were favouring England. It's not like England can say, oh, we lost the game just because of that scrum. And it was a bad call. It wasn't a bad call. It was the right call. But we got the rub of the green as well at times. And just going into it, you know, you question Steve Borthwick, Taking off Marler and Cole, um, and I, you know I don't know whether lads can go eighty minutes anymore, and that's perhaps an issue with the game. Is there and a deep issue at front row for? Well, I mean, Carl Sinclair w was poor, wasn't he? You know, there's a, there was a a big difference when Coley went off, um, and Carl Sinclair hasn't he's not played that well for a while, has he? I don't think he's not dominated scrums. Um, seems to have lost, lost his edge a little bit, I think. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. You say poor, it's poor compared to what South Africa brought on. All the talk in the week was Oxen Che and how yeah. world class he's been. It comes down to personnel. We mentioned this when we were talking about Scotland. It's you, you can, whoever you've got your best players, whether or not it's Will Stewart to come on, whether or not Coley, who's 52, comes on or starts, and you've got Carl Sinclair as well. You're either a scrummage or you're not. And we saw yeah. in the final four years ago, England's Achilles heel was the scrum that lost them the World Cup. It lost them that game in the final. Getting that was Coley then, the scrum. It? And that was Coley. Yeah. So, because Sinks went off pretty early. It answers your question, Andy Rowe. And the, it's been doing the rounds. We saw Matt Williams talking about it on Virgin Media's side of the media around the scrums and the power around that that the different teams have. Like, should that be the case? Is that the kind of game that we want to have? That's what South African rugby's built, been built on. And you look at where it changed in the last 10 minutes. Scrum pen, kick to corner, line out drive. The referee breaks out, power play. RG Snyman around the corner, runner off nine. Bang, power. And yeah. then that was a repeat for the next kind of eight or nine minutes and effectively won South Africa the game, got them into the final. Crazy. Yeah. But that's how they play. How did you rate Steve Borthwick's performance tactically as a coach here? Well, that's performance of England, how we were set up, was how Steve was always going to coach that team in that game of that magnitude and that weather with the tools at his disposal in terms of the players um, and you, however they got to those arousal levels and emotional levels and physical levels is a tip of the slipper to whoever got them to that because collectively we haven't seen that have we I don't think since four years ago when we beat you Kiwis Andy Ray in the semi-final oh there's a long time ago yeah it is we've moved uh, on. But, but we have but and then you know, on the flip side of that, Goody, you like we we know we've played in them games. Like there's games where you rock up, there's games where you turn up like England did, like they did against New Zealand four years ago, like South Africa did against France, like Ireland did against, and the All Blacks did against each other. You can't do that week on week. That is the challenge, right, for yeah. any team. Is how do you back up that? South Africa could, couldn't get to that emotional level. Yeah. But as we've spoken about, we know the players. We've seen them play we know emotionally there is a level that they can get to, which is at the highest level, which they showed yeah. at the weekend. But doing that week on week is, I, I'd say, near on impossible. 
That's been part of the frustration, though, hasn't it? Like watching this England team, and you're right, we haven't seen them for four years. Yeah, it's a long time to be waiting for you to turn up and play properly. Yeah, um, it's the truth. Yeah, and you know, I'm devastated. We're out. Uh, we controlled huge parts of the game, and. When you come so close, it hurts even more, right? So if we'd lost by 10 or 15 points, you're like, well, do you know what? We just lost the world champs and we were we were great, but they're a way better team. When you had it in your own power, 15-6 up with 12 minutes to go, you know, you've got to win that game. Um, and a couple of things went against England, rightly so by the referee, and we lose it. But that has been the question. That's been the frustration. And that's where England fans have been over the last few years. The disconnect between the team and the fans' performance expectation, that all married up on Saturday night. Um, and everyone was, you know, fully behind that England team. And you can see, like, the desire of them. I'm seeing Elliot Daly going and smashing boys where, you know, we've yeah, seen... Yeah, who did he smash? Your Mulan. Yeah, and we've seen, you know, we've seen Elliot Daly drop off a lot of tackles in England shirt previously. He's a, he's a friend of mine. And, you know, he was questioned around his defensive capabilities. Well, he's just shown it in a... World Cup semi-final, how hard he can be when he wants it. And, and everyone was at that level. I say everyone. Most were at that level, which produced an amazing sort of, not backs against the wall performance because we dominated huge swathes of that game, but it was backs against the wall in terms of what everyone thought from the outside about England, including England fans. So the connection's back. The next thing is what's going to happen post-World Cup. There seemed to be genuine beef between the two sides as well, wasn't there? Yeah, I'd say the height and tension around what's at stake, the way England are, and I said it last week, how some people say you can see why England aren't very well liked. Um, and they were celebrating every micro victory, weren't they? And and that was part of getting them to that emotional state to really dominate and you know take this game to South Africa. So the big thing about Vili LaRue celebrating at the end, which caused a bit of a push and shove in. He's know, come in from 50 metres away. He yeah. has screamed and yeah. shouting and screaming. He hasn't just gone up to one player, he's gone to a few and just yeah. run around. I'm not face. defending him at all. Like he's 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 gone up, screamed and, and then sort of jumped over and there's two England players there. And I couldn't see who it was, but he's given it big licks to them. But let's not forget England have been doing that all game as well. Not running them from fifty metres, but you watch everything. Marrow's got his one hand up in the air, Ben Earl, they're all doing it. Tom Curry. Um and there's nothing wrong with it, but the other thing is, if you're doing it in the game as an England player and then you lose, it's going to come back to you. Mm. And, and the opposition, loads of people would have watched that celebration, all the celebrating. It's well documented, isn't it? So, and Villa LaRue, you know, he's obviously got history in the Prem with Wasps and Saracens and all that stuff. And who knows? Who know? No one can put themselves in the position of either Villa LaRue or any of the England players because they've just lost a World Cup semi final in the last two minutes or just won a World Cup semi final in the last two minutes. How do you know what that emotion brings out in people? And yeah, a bit of pushing and shoving and Vili LaRue, you can probably look at it and go, he's gone over the top. But, you know, it was a physical war. I think there was a lot of respect, but also a lot of, when, you, when you, you've got two monster teams going at each other. And I saw what Razzie put out around the side. I couldn't believe it. Do you see the tweet that Razzie put out around the size of players? The age, the size, the average weight and all this stuff. Yeah. What was it? Like England were bigger. England, England were bigger. England had <laughs> more what? caps, more experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're just fans that watch it. And Jim's obviously that was their pitch side. You can't understand the emotion unless you've lived it. And I haven't lived that in a World Cup semi-final. Not many people have the pain and the ecstasy. But there, there was clearly beef because it's a, it's a war, isn't it? Rugby can be, and that was a one for the purists of out and out, who's who's bigger, who's more powerful. It came down to the scrum, the driving line out, the big hits, the defence. wasn't pretty rugby, but those games bring out more in people, don't they, in terms of emotions, because it is alpha on alpha, who's got the biggest nuts. And unfortunately, Slavka just had a little bit too much for us with the scrum and Ox and Che and Vincent Cock. Talk about nuts, Vincent Cock. Yeah. He came on and he had an absolute world of yeah. a... They, yeah, they turned the scrum round. Um, from what was very stable, and, and that they were just very small differences in a, you know, an epic contest that went down to one point in the last two minutes. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod.